Hey guys, Michael Hyatt here. Welcome to this episode of The Michael Hyatt Show. We're going to be starting in just a minute. This is the pre-show, so if you've tuned in early, fantastic. I'm glad you're here. And I'd love to have your friends here with us too. So please click on the share button while we're waiting to start. Invite them to join. You're going to be a hero. You're going to be glad you invited them because today I've got a very special guest on a very important topic. If you're any kind of creative, if you're a writer, if you're a record producer, if you're an artist, a photographer, an entrepreneur, whatever it is, you're definitely going to want to catch this episode because I've got Jeff Goins on, who's the author of the brand new book, Real uh, Artist Don't Starve. And we're going to be talking about that topic because there's a lot of myths surrounding that, a lot of things that keep creatives stuck. And we're going to be confronting those myths and talk about what to do instead. But while we're waiting, I'd love to know where you're watching from. Personally, I just got back from vacation. Gail and I got in late Friday night. We went to New York City. We saw The Lion King, which I'd never seen. We went to three different museums, including the Museum uh, of, what is it called? Museum of Modern Art, which was fantastic. We had a great experience there. And uh, then we went from there to Asheville, North Carolina, and we toured the Biltmore. This is a thing that we do every year or so with uh, whichever grandchild has turned 13. So we took my granddaughter, Felicity. Then we went on down to the Smoky Mountains, and we had a naturalist that we hired for three days who took us through the Smoky Mountains, and we looked at all kinds of plants and animals. Phenomenal. Some of the best hiking I've ever done. If you've never been to the Smoky Mountains, you've got to do it. But where are you guys watching from? I'm going to go over to the comment cam and take a scroll through what you guys are posting here. <laughs> Lurie says, you have a grandchild turn 13 every year. Well, it's worked out that way for the last three years, but uh, then we got one next year and then there's going to be a gap. So yeah, we're not that prolific, but almost. All right, Ken, good to see you from Fort Lauderdale. Shauna from Arizona. Silla from Franklin. Jeff Goins, he's on right here from Franklin. Uh, Donald Newman from Orlando. Clay from Laurel, Mississippi. Clay, awesome to see you. And Aaron, who says, absolutely love Jeff's work. The man is the real McCoy or the real McGoins. And yeah, so cool. Let me just uh, refresh what I've got going here in Periscope because I've got this still connecting thing going on. This, by the way, is why we have the pre-show, so that we can iron out all this fun stuff, because I want to get all your comments. Nobody really on YouTube yet except Leon, but Leon hasn't, Leon hasn't told me where he's calling from or watching from. Kirsten from Eris. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, Indiana. Uh, Nick on YouTube from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I just love saying Coeur d'Alene. I've never been there, but that's got to be awesome. Jeff from Nashville. Hey, Jeff. And Jeff Goins, I know you can hear me. I think a lot of your fans are joining right now. Um, Don, you're watching from Saginaw, Michigan. Okay, another question. I'm going to go back here to my notes. But has anyone, be honest now, let's pretend we're on the honest planet and it's just us, okay? Has anyone ever discouraged you from pursuing a creative passion professionally because they were afraid that you couldn't earn a living? Um, I, I'm really grateful that I didn't, that that never happened to me. And I want to I tell you a story. It's about my dad, who was amazing in this regard. So he's 83 years old. He's still living. He was over here yesterday. Um, it's actually my birthday yesterday. So we celebrated. My dad and mom came and we had a blast. But when I was 18, I was a freshman in college. And at the end of my first semester, I came to my dad and man, I was scared to death. I said, dad, I've been invited. I was a music major. I've been invited to play in a rock band in Denton, Texas. And I'm thinking about dropping out of college and doing that. What do you think? And I mean, I, I kind of wanted to do, duck because I wasn't sure if he was going to throw something at me or not. But you know what he said? I mean, he kind of paused for a minute, rubbed his chin, and then he said, I think that's a phenomenal idea. And I was like, really? Why do you say that? And he said, this is the perfect time in your life for this. He said, if it doesn't work out, 
you know, you can re-enroll in, in school this next summer, take the spring off and, and give this a whirl. And I couldn't believe it. He was so supportive, so encouraging. That band lasted six weeks. <laughs> the guys that were in the band with me, all they wanted to do was smoke weed all the time. And they were like too stoned to practice. And I finally got fed up with it, threw up my hands. They were really talented musicians. But I just gave up. And at the time, I was living in Waco, Texas. Came back. My dad didn't shame me. He didn't say anything negative. He said, that's fine. You know, now go on to the next thing. So I ended up getting a job for the rest of the spring semester and then went on um, to back to college that summer. So anyway, what about you guys? I'm going to go back to the comment cam here. Got so many other people. Yeah, thanks, Denise. She said, happy birthday. Cheryl says, lost my job in 2009. It is harder as you get older to get work. Okay. Uh, Donald says, love your guitar story, Michael. I just read it recently where you started playing again. I did. I've got a Martin D28 that I bought about three years ago, which I absolutely love. It was a guitar that I had back in my college days, sold it because I gave up kind of on playing music. But now I'm getting more back into it. In fact, for my birthday, Gail bought me Irish flute lessons. So I'm excited to get into that. Laura said, what a story. Scylla said, yes, I'm a recording artist, and I was told so many times that I will starve my whole life if I become a professional singer. Clay said all the time, that, by the way, this is all on Facebook, um, every time someone told me I couldn't run marathons, I proved them wrong 20 times so far. Love that. Um, Eric said, hi from Hendersonville. Peter said, oh, the Hyatts would be a great name for the band. <laughs> well, I, God knows I've got enough kids. I've got five daughters. It would be an awesome Band, they would make great backup harmony. Actually, they probably should, should sing the lead. Eric says, does the voice inside our head count? Absolutely, that counts. Okay, so one more question because we've got just a minute and 51 seconds left. But think about this. If you knew it would be financially viable, what creative career would you pursue? Now, I'm going to tell you that I would do exactly what I'm doing now. And as you're thinking of your answer, as you're responding in Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, I'm not quite sure we're going on Periscope, but regardless, um, post a comment, share this, please, with your friends. You're going to be glad you did because my, uh, my guest, Jeff Coins, is going to be fantastic. You're going to want to hear him and it's going to be really powerful because we're going to be talking about whether you can make a living as an artist, okay? So um, let's just see what questions we have here. Clay says, a motivational speaker. Awesome. John said, that's cool. I'm a professional uh, flautist. People, even teachers said, I would never make a dime doing it. At 20, I began playing in a symphony. Awesome. On YouTube. Uh, Style Life Photography said, Chris from Ohio. Ah, Stephanie said, you're on early today. Yeah, we actually changed the official time for the show from 7 p.m., to 4 p.m. I'm going to go back to the main camera. The reason why I'm doing that is because this works better with my lifestyle. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. And it works better for my team. We really believe at Michael Hyatt and Company in the concept of radical margin. And people have time for their families, their friends, and for the things that matter most. And when you have a show in the evening, it's not exactly conducive to that. So we decided to move it to the late afternoon. So again, I'm excited. Go ahead and share this. Um, with your friends, I would love to get you on. And as we're talking, as I'm interviewing Jeff, I want you guys to post your comments. All right? Let's start. The myth of the starving artist is pervasive in our culture. Now, we've all heard the jokes about the useless nature of an arts degree, or we've been given the well-meaning but dream-crushing advice, don't quit your day job, right? Well, the underlying assumption is that a creative career is synonymous with risk and financial instability. But what if that's not true? What if you could actually make a living as an artist? Well, according to my guest, Jeff Goins, that's entirely possible, as evidenced by generations of thriving artists who've achieved great success by capitalizing on their creative strengths. And he's here to reveal how you can do the same. Hello, I'm Michael Hyatt. Welcome to my live show, where each week I talk with a different thought leader about some aspect of personal development, productivity, or leadership. My goal is to help you win at work, succeed at life, 
and lead with confidence. Let's get started. I'm here with my good friend, Jeff Goins. Jeff is a writer, a speaker, an entrepreneur, whose work has appeared in hundreds of magazines, publications, and blogs. And he's also the national best-selling author of five books, including The War of Art, and his latest book, Real Artists Don't Starve, aims to debunk the myth of the starving artist, and instead cast a compelling vision for how we can attain success in a creative career. And he's here to share some of those pointers with us. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, Michael. Good to be here. Yeah, it's so great to have you on. I just love your book. This is absolutely must-reading for anybody that's a, a creative, whether they're writers, photographers, entrepreneurs, whatever it is, this is an essential book. So thanks for writing it. Thanks for saying that. That means a lot to me. Appreciate it. Well, I mean it. So first question I want to ask you, why okay. do we romanticize the myth of the starving artist? Where does that come from? So it's uh, what's interesting about this story, and it is a story. And in the book, I make the argument that whatever story you believe, you end up living. So uh, being a starving artist today, I argue, is a choice, not a necessary condition of doing creative work. And so whether or not you starve today because of all the opportunities that exist, that's – that's your choice. That's up to you. Where does this come from? Well, what, what's interesting about this story, it is, it's not the oldest story that we have about artists. And so the story comes from the Romantic era in the you know, mid-1800s, you know, mid to late 19th century, where this guy named Henri Merger uh, wrote uh, a series of short stories. He was a failed artist and author, and he was frustrated. He lived in Paris, and he was surrounded by all these creative geniuses, and he aspired to do uh, great creative work and, and failed. And sort of as a means of getting his frustration out, as we writers sometimes do, he wrote about it. And he wrote a series of stories that eventually, after his death, became the opera La Boheme and then eventually the musical Rents, and even Moulin Rouge was kind of a spinoff of this story. And what he does in the story is he romanticizes poverty and art and this whole, whole idea of the bohemian. Uh, you know, the beret wearing, cigarette smoking, suffering artist, and, and and this idea that only serious art, serious creative work comes from this place. It comes from this story. And uh, yeah, I mean, like we've seen some of this. I get it. What's interesting about the story of the starving artist is, as I said, it's not the oldest story about creative work that we have. And I started this book when I bumped into a 500 year old story about the artist Michelangelo and how he was the wealthiest artist of the Renaissance. And this project began with a question. If you have Michelangelo, who is arguably the best artist of the Renaissance, if not of all time, one of the best. Mm -hmm. And at his time, he was the wealthiest, richest artist who had ever come along. All of a sudden, I think we're left with a dilemma. And the dilemma is this, do art and business, like can they not coexist? The, the story that I grew up hearing was, well, you can't go do that. You can't go be a musician or be an actor or be a writer because you're going to starve. You better have a backup plan. And for years I believed this myth. And guess what? When you believe a myth, it has a way of coming true in your life. But when I stopped believing that and I started believing another story, the story of the thriving artist, the story that Michelangelo believed and many who followed in his footsteps – Guess what happens there? You become this thing that you think about and, and, and the story that you believe, the story of the thriving artist. So I wrote this book uh, because we are familiar with the story of the starving artist, but we are less familiar with the other side of the story, which I think today can be the norm, not the exception, the story of the thriving artist. Okay, I want to get into that in just a minute, okay. but I want to drill down just a little bit on Michelangelo because yes. – you had me at page one when you started telling that story. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were interviewing a guy that was researching Michelangelo, and he was doing some research on his bank records. And so yeah. I just want to kind of put into perspective how much money Michelangelo made. So could you kind of recount that, that story and sort of the magnitude of his success? So there's this gentleman named Rab Hatfield who took me six months to track down. 
But I had to track him down. His book is on my shelf somewhere here. It's called The Wealth of Michelangelo. That took me three months to track down. Hang on, it's right here. I want to grab it because I think it's fun. Okay, so I've got this book here, right? Like, look at this. It's such an exciting wow. <laughs> cover page. <laughs> uh, so um, this is an out-of-print academic book full of ledgers. <laughs> and the story is this. Uh, Rab Hatfield in 2003 was trying to track down some dates. He was not trying to find out how much money Michelangelo had because he didn't care. Uh, but what he was trying to do is he was trying to date the different sections that the Sistine Chapel was painted. It took a few years to paint it. And Michelangelo was an avid uh, letter writer. And so what he was trying to do was um, go, okay, he wrote this letter about this piece of the Sistine Chapel. So we can, you know, assume that this part was painted, you know, in this date range. Uh, and he, he was kind of coming up empty. He couldn't connect the dots. And then he had this idea. Well, he received his commissions in installments. And so it made sense that he could go to the bank records and find out, well, if he received, you know, this commission on this date, then that means that section was done by that time, right? Uh, and so he goes to the bank records and, and he says it's as simple as going, you know, into the archives in Florence, looking up the letter M and saying, oh, here's his bank records. And that's what he did. And he began to see in those bank accounts exorbitant amounts of money, the equivalent of hundreds of thousands and then millions of dollars just sitting in his bank in the year 1501, you know, and he's just looking at these records going, something's not adding up here with what I've been told about this artist. And he starts this project where he basically pulls together all of these pieces of research that has been done over the past 50 years. And he, and he brings it all together into this project that he calls the wealth of Michelangelo. And he finds out that Michelangelo had about $50 million in financial holdings at the time of his death, which made him the richest artist of the Renaissance. But not only that, at that point, the richest artist who had ever lived. Wow. We could do an entire show on Michelangelo because you talk later in the yeah. book about his apprenticeship and, and just sort of his beliefs about himself and all that. Maybe we'll get into that in a little bit. But to the cynic who might say to you, okay, okay, I get it. You know, he was the, you know, the Michael Jackson of his age or whatever. Um, and says, but are there any other examples? Or is he the exception that sort of proves the rule of the starving artist? What would you say to that? Yeah, so um, I think whatever you're looking for, you're going to find. I mean, that's sort of my belief on that. Um, I started this project with a question. And I'm a full-time writer, and I've been doing this for six years now. And I have gone through most of this career with this question, which is, is what I accomplished, is it the norm or is it the exception? In other words, did I get lucky? And, and like I get that, like luck happens to some of us, and I, I totally understand that. But over the past few years, I keep bumping, bumping into two groups of people, people who are killing it, who are in a variety of creative fields, writer, musician, creative entrepreneur, and so on. And I started to notice some of the, like the similarities between their story and my story and each other's stories. And then I also, living in Nashville, I know you can relate to this, Mike, um, I bump into people who are what we would call starving artists, you know, sort of the yep. standard thing you would imagine. People who, you know, it's their hobby, they're waiting tables, or they're working at a corporate job and this creative thing on the side, whether it's speaking, I heard somebody say that in the pre-show, writing, uh, even doing kind of an online business, which is becoming more and more popular. But it's this thing that they do on the side, and they say the thing that I said for years before I started this, which is, well, I could never do this for a living, right? This is just a blank, a hobby, something I do for fun, whatever. And I began to notice, anecdotally, mind you, I began to notice that the things that what we'll call thriving artists did, the successful creatives, uh, a lot of those were similar. Like they were doing mm. a lot of the same things. And it turns out that the things that they were doing were many of the things that the starving artists were not doing. So for years, I just kind of noticed these things. They were little data points for me. And I was going, maybe there's a correlation here. Then I read the story of Michelangelo and I go, hold on a second. What are the things that have always been true that have led to creative success? What are the things that artists, entrepreneurs, puppeteers, actors, cartoonists, you name it, have always done that have led to their success? And is there some sort of co correlation here? And I'm an avid reader of biographies uh, and I've been reading artist biographies and author biographies for years. And so I start with the Michelangelo story. And I go, okay, like, right, is he just an outlier or is, is, is the story that we've been told about real artists, is it true? 
And, and I started uncovering things about uh, Michelangelo, Van Gogh, Picasso, uh, contemporary artists, uh, people who are dancers and choreographers. And a lot of these things that I've been noticing in, in these modern day thriving artists, they possess these same qualities. And then just, you know, like after reading hundreds of biographies, pulling all these things together, just to sort of test the assumptions, like maybe these are things that worked 50 years ago, but don't work anymore. And so then I conduct hundreds of one-on-one -on -one interviews with modern day creatives who are successful, who are not famous by the way, right? Like I didn't, right. uh, with all due respect to you, Michael, I didn't interview you, right? Uh, I interviewed people whose names you've probably never heard of before unless you read the book and they're thriving. Like I said, they're cartoonists, they're actors, they're writers, and they're in some sort of creative field. They're doing their work full time and they're making a living off of it. And by the way, they're having fun. They're really enjoying it. And so the book uh, is a case. I'm making a case. You don't have to starve. If you are starving today, that's a choice, not something that is a necessity for you to be creative. And the book is 12 rules. And these 12 rules came about as the 12 common things that I saw the thriving artists doing for the past 500 years. And they are the 12 things that starving artists often actively avoid. And so it's, it's not a question of luck or uh, opportunity. It's a question of, are you willing to do the work? Because this isn't just a book about being creative. It's about taking your creativity and using it as a strategic advantage to succeed in your career, whatever that looks like for you. Fantastic. Okay, if you're just joining us, I'm interviewing Jeff Goins, the author of the new book, Real Artists Don't Starve. So if you're an artist, if you're a creative, if you're an entrepreneur, if you really dream about doing something that you would enjoy that's creative, but you've thought that maybe you can't make a living doing it, you're going to watch, want to watch the rest of this show. And in addition, let me encourage you to share it right now. And we're also taking questions, and we'll be getting to some questions in just a minute. I've got one more question to ask Jeff before I do that. So post it in the comments if you want us to answer the question live. Okay, Jeff, in the book, I think you have this. You've got this table where you have the starving artists and you have the thriving artists, and you contrast kind of the difference between them. Could you um, basically share that with us? That, I think that's in Chapter 1, but you set up the whole book with that. You want me to read all of them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I don't have them all memorized. There's 12 of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, let me pull it up. No, they're fantastic. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the idea here, and I call these the 12 rules of the new renaissance. And so if we look at Michelangelo as an archetype, right? So the whole book is not just based on him, but as you mentioned, Michael, he's a thread. And I just think here you have somebody who is very financially successful, and he's also incredibly creative, one-of-a-kind artist, a genius uh, and and like you've got both versions of success, the richest guy, the richest artist of his time and the best. Right. I mean, so this contradicts the idea that like being really financially su successful means you're a sellout or being really creatively successful, successful means that you're going to starve. And I think you can be financially successful and creatively successful and not have to starve or sell out. And so here are these rules. And like I said, these are choices that you make. If you follow these things, the more of these you follow, the more successful you're going to be in your creative career. Uh, the fewer of them you follow, the less successful you're going to be, or the more you're going to be rolling the dice, essentially. Okay, so here it goes. The starving artist believes you must be born an artist. The thriving artist knows you must become one. That's rule number one. It's a choice. Rule number two, the starving artist strives to be original. The thriving artist steals from his influences. That's rule number two. Three, the starving artist believes he has enough talent. The thriving artist apprentices, apprentices under a master. Rule number four, the starving artist is stubborn about everything. The thriving artist is stubborn about the right things. Rule number five, the starving artist waits to be noticed. The thriving artist cultivates patrons. Rule number six, the starving artist believes he can be creative anywhere. The thriving artist goes where creative work is already happening. Rule number seven, the starving artist always works alone. The thriving artist collaborates with others. Rule number eight, the starving artist does his work in private. The thriving artist practices in public. Rule number nine, the starving artist works for free. The thriving artist always works for something. Rule number 10, the starving artist sells out too soon. The thriving artist owns his work. Rule number 11, the starving artist masters one craft. 
The thriving artist masters many. And finally, rule number 12, the starving artist despises the need for money. The thriving artist makes money to make more art. Love that. Okay, if you would to, if you were to create a poster with that comparison on it, I would absolutely put that in my office. Just say it. I don't know if there's a market for it, but I'll buy the first one. Okay. okay thanks. Uh, let's take some questions because we've got some that have been coming in here. Here's one from YouTube. Um, Endon Rose Bowling asks, do you have advice for someone with zero positive artistic encouragement? Find somebody to encourage you. I mean, that sounds like you're hanging out with the wrong people. And um, one of the books that I read that I highly recommend, it's a little bit academic, uh, but one of the books that I read when I was doing a lot of research just on the, the study of creativity was uh, the book called Creativity by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Don't ask me to spell that. Just Google creativity. Uh, search it on Amazon, creativity. I'm impressed and it you is like, say that. Yeah, lots of practice. Yeah, good, good for you. <laughs> Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I have to look um, it up every time. Yeah, he's. I can't, yeah, me too. I've got to. I've got to like Google it to you know get the spelling right. Um, uh, he's the flow guy. If you're familiar with right. that that video, uh, the TED Talk where he talks about flow is um, you know the ideal state of happiness, which is basically where competency meets challenge. That's flow. Anyway, about creativity, he says this: it is easier to be more creative. If you want to be more creative, it is. Easier to do that by moving someplace, going someplace where creative work is already happening, changing your surroundings, than it is to just will yourself to be more creative. And so one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is the social component of creative work. Everything from marketing, which I like prefer to call practicing in public, just sharing your work in places where it's going to get found, collaboration with other artists, and even networking, not going to cocktail parties and handing out your business card, but just getting around a scene, a place where there is a people that will resonate with your work and encourage it. Every story that I found of creative success had this at its core. I've had this. I've needed it. And my argument in the book is the scene that you need may be closer than you think it is. So mm -hmm. not all of us can move to the other side of the world, but many of us can move across the room, right? And I would argue that that's yeah. your first step to finding your scene. I remember living in Nashville, watching all of these bloggers and writers become authors and being envious of them and telling myself, oh, I could never do that. Right. And, and like I said earlier, Michael, um, we find whatever we're looking for. And if I'm looking for a reason to not succeed, I'm going to find that. And then I realized, well, this is the scene that I'm a part of. You know, I'm not I don't live in San Francisco or uh, New York City. So I can't, you know, like those feel like better scenes to start an online business or to become an author. I just live in Nashville. And I was like, well, I'll see. I'll, I'll step out my door and see what I can do, you know, and I'll go meet it. I'll go hang out at this coffee shop and see who I bump into. I'll go to this free meetup over here. I'll, I'll try to save up some cash to go to this conference. And when I started showing up in the places where the kind of work that I wanted to do was already happening, I met people who were incredibly influential on me as a person and on my work. Michael, you were one of those people. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, I also found encouragement and resonance with the work that I was trying to do. And by the way, just in case you're going, well, I'll never be able to meet, you know, Michael Hyatt or somebody, you don't have to. I would say probably the most valuable relationships I made uh, during that season was going someplace and finding five other people like me who were up and comers or who were struggling and having somebody that I could share uh, my struggles with and commiserate with. And, and get encouraged by. So um, I, I do not, I think, it, I, I think it is imperative. You have to find people who encourage you. And that may start with going to a Facebook group. And if you're going, well, who can I connect with today, right? Look at the people in the comments right here. Like say, hey, I need encouragement. And I, I want you to do that right now. Post in the comments, I need encouragement if you need encouragement. And then somebody who's watching this, who's an encourager, please. Uh, and then secondly, like if you need something, try to be that person to somebody else because these relationships are um, are best when you know when they're mutual, when we're encouraging and being encouraged. So I hope that helps. That's fantastic. I remember Don Miller, our mutual friend, said to me one time, "Where you do what you do is important." Yeah. And I've written on this before too on my blog, and I think it's such a gift for us to live here in Nashville, where we have other creatives. But honestly, they're everywhere. You just yeah. got to open your eyes to find them. And it's kind of like what you said. You're going to find what you go looking for. 
And it's kind of like after you buy a, a new car. You know, I remember I bought a Nissan Leaf a few years ago, and I thought, gosh, I, I'm like the only guy that's got one of these cool electric cars. And then I started seeing them everywhere. And so it's, it's what you notice. So anyway, thanks for sharing that. We've got some yep. comments that have been coming in. Uh, Joe Batali says, I'm an attorney for creatives. This is on Facebook, by the way. And it's been my experience that for artists and creatives, starving or thriving is really a choice. Yep, exactly. Using your creativity as a strategic advantage. Then on Facebook, Ashley Murphy says, thanks for reminding me I am not starving and encourage me not to starve. Real artists mm. don't starve is an amazing read. Now, Don asked a question on Facebook. This is Donald Newman. He said, my question is for both of you. If I'm in a day job that I love and want to stay in for a while, but I'm looking for a future when I would want to change pace and become more focused on writing, speaking, and maybe some coaching, how do you plan to build for that? Or how do you build a path to eventually work more fully as a writer or a coach? Jeff, why don't you go first and then I'll, I'll answer that too. Well, I actually wrote about this on your blog a few weeks ago, um, and I'll, I'll try to link up to this at, uh, in the comments afterwards. Um, this is what I call the baby step strategy. Uh, by the way, I think this is the best way to chase your dream. And this is a little bit counterintuitive, I think, in this age of advice about taking a leap and um, uh, you know going big or going home. And uh, I just, as a family man, as a as a husband and dad of two kids, um, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm not a risk averse person. But when I was working a day job that I actually enjoyed, I didn't love it, but didn't hate it. Um, I saw a lot of people, I was in my late 20s, and I saw a lot of peers who were getting kind of restless. You know, they'd work somewhere for six months or a few years, uh, and they wanted to go do something else. And I knew what that felt like, right? I, I knew that that sort of nagging feeling that I should be doing something else, that my job wasn't completely fulfilling me as a person. I wasn't self-actualizing through my career. And I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek here because I think these are big expectations to have of the job. Um, but I felt that. And I... I also had the gift of seeing people quit their jobs prematurely and and really have like going after their thing, being a writer, speaker, entrepreneur. These are kind of the most common things that I saw. And then things not working out as well as they thought they would. You know, they were sort of planning on best case scenario and worst case scenario happened. And six months later, they were back at Starbucks or, you know, some other place. And they had actually left their cushy job and now been replaced there. And we're worse off than you know when they started. I think that's an unwise way to do it. I prefer building a bridge versus taking a leap, uh, following what I call the baby step strategy. And in the book, I talk about how John Grisham did this. I love this story because you think of I John Grisham. He sold he, he sold like three hundred million copies of his books to date. Super mega star author. And I'm not saying you have to do that to be successful, but here's how he did it: not by taking a giant leap. He's a first of all, he's a full time lawyer when he does this, and he is a father. Uh, and a husband. And so imagine really, really busy person, right? Not honestly, like I, I started this by working uh, at a nonprofit, having some flexibility in my schedule. That was really a gift. He doesn't have that. And he just has this idea. What if I were a writer? What, what, what would happen? Like, could I even do this? And he's not sure. And I love that. Because so many of us go, I dream of doing this. And I teach a community of writers online. It's one of the things that I do. And I often hear this from readers. They go, I want to be a full-time writer. My question is always, how much are you writing right now? And almost inevitably, the answer is not very much. Or, you know, like it's, they're not doing it on a steady basis. Grisham understands this. And so what he does is he does the baby step strategy. He gets up a little bit early every single day, goes to the office, distraction-free place, uh, and writes one page of a novel just to see if he has what it takes. It takes him two years to finish the book, and then he publishes it. It's not very successful. He says, well, that's so much. That was fun. I'm going to do another. Again, no breakthrough success. He's two years in this process. Writes another book. Takes about another year. Again, same strategy. Get up every day, write at least one page, go to work, you know, and, and go on with the rest of my day. Just kind of slow and steady process. The next book uh, is, is The Firm. He ends up selling that after 40 rejections. He ends up selling that to a major publisher and it eventually becomes a mega bestseller. And then he goes, okay, I'm about four years into this process. Uh, I've been practicing this for years now and now I have two books out and I'm successful. Okay, now I'll go all in on this. And uh, more often than not, this is what it takes to succeed. Not some big bet. 
but a bunch of little small bets that over time add up to momentum. And as people ask me, when did you know you could quit your job? When I replaced my income, like it was in the bank. And I'm not saying you have to be that conservative, uh, but like I had momentum. I remember going to my boss, uh, you know, hat in my hand, uh, worried that he's going to be disappointed in me because my boss had been my mentor for seven years. I had a good relationship with him. I said, I, I think it's time for me to move on. He goes, oh, yeah, totally. I've been waiting for this conversation. Go. <laughs> you know, like I'm proud of you. It's time. What are you still doing around here? And I realized not every person's relationship with their boss is like that. But the way I saw it, this was my calling. This is the thing that I wanted to do for the next 25, 30 years. I was okay with it taking two or three years to get there. And it did. It took two years. So take your time. Slow and steady really does win the race. My practical advice is do one small thing every single day, five days a week. You can take the weekends off to just put a little drip in a bucket that over time will lead to something tremendous. That once that engine is going, once that momentum is moving, it will be really, really hard to slow down. (laughs) <laughs> great, great story. Okay, so for me, it was a little bit different, but there's some similarities. So I've actually done this twice. Wow. So I was in the publishing world for most of my career, and then I decided to set out with a business partner. We just, we just up and quit our jobs and decided to go raise the money for this new publishing company. And I want to tell you, that put enormous stress on my family. Uh, there were times when we couldn't hardly eat. You know, when we're late on our bills, it stressed me out totally, stressed my partner out, and it was not the best decision. Now, we were successful for a time. That, that publishing company inevitably took off like a rocket, but not without a lot of stress. And I was working like seven days a week, 12 hours a day trying to make it happen because, you know, we we're trying to gin up enough money uh, to survive. And so that business, it didn't go bankrupt, but we were so broke, all of our assets had been pledged, so we couldn't even, and I've told the story a lot, so I won't belabor it, but all of our assets had been pledged, so we couldn't even liquidate those to pay off our debts. So we essentially went bankrupt without officially declaring bankruptcy. So the next time, so I go back to Thomas Nelson, um, working there, was pretty successful, and ended up becoming the CEO and the chairman of the company. But in 2004... I started to blog. Never, Jeff, as you know this, never thinking that I would ever do this full time. I mean, it was just a hobby uh, because I wanted a a place to have creative expression. And uh, so I so I did it there. But after seven years and kind of proving the concept and beginning to monetize my platform. Now, I didn't replace my income like you, but I got to the point where I realized that if I was doing this full time, I didn't have any doubt that I could replace my income. A little bit of doubt, maybe, but not a lot. And so I left because I thought, this is my shot. This is my chance to do it. But I totally agree with your concept there about kind of proving the concept. And don't put yourself out there under enormous stress. Go ahead and do it as a, as a side thing and prove the concept and then step into it if it's, if it's the right time. But I want to I answer this question or ask this question of you, Jeff. Um, did you personally... And your boss was fantastic. But did you ever personally receive the advice, don't quit your day job? And if you did, how did you cope with it? That's a good question because there's sort of two extremes of this, right? Like leap in the net will appear, which happens sometimes. But nobody ever talks about what happens when it doesn't. You fall flat on your face. Like what is the – Whoops, have we – Oh, did you lose me? We did for just a second there. I don't think we have him on the main feed there. There we go. Okay. Great. Cool. Uh, So just to go back, uh, your income was harder to replace than mine because you were a CEO and I was working at a nonprofit (laughs) fundraising my salary. So just just to be clear. Put it in perspective. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. uh, I mean I think there's two extremes. Don't quit your day job uh, ever, you know, because like who knows what could happen. It's risky, right? Uh, And then, you know, the other side would be um, uh, like – leap in the net will appear. And and that works out sometimes, but I, I don't ever hear anybody talk about like, what happens when you sometimes make a leap? You fall flat on your face. And what is the plan there? In that post that I mentioned, again, I'll, I'll link to it because I think it's fascinating. There's a study that I read conducted um, by a couple of researchers at the University of Wisconsin 
about uh, like two different ways to launch a business. And they followed over 5,000 American entrepreneurs for 15 years and basically followed risk takers, people who quit their jobs and then started a business, and then people who uh, kept their jobs but started a business on the side. And uh, the people who kept their jobs and started the business on the side were twice as likely to succeed, meaning the failure rate was much higher with those who kind of went all in because of what you mentioned, Michael, all that pressure and even kind of your experience of, you know, betting the farm. And then sometimes that goes south. Uh, so I knew that I didn't want to be doing this for the rest of my life, uh, working at this nonprofit. And, and I also knew that I was in a really good place where I could take my time building this dream. And I know some people aren't in that place. And sometimes it makes sense to quit one job, you know, say where you're working 70 hours a week to take something where you're still bringing in enough income uh, that you can sort of sustain yourself. Uh, but it gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility to build this thing on the side, which I'm a fan of. Uh, but when I was at that job and it was becoming clear that I was on a certain trajectory to not stay there for the next 10 years, I did have a few people come to me. And I actually went to you uh, during this time because you gave me some good advice on how to deal with this. I came to some people. Uh, some people came to me and said, first of all, we feel threatened by what you're doing. It looks like you're spending all this time not working, which I think is a legitimate thing to be aware of. If you have a day job and you're trying mm -hmm. to build a business, particularly with a blog, anything where personal brand is associated with that, because it can look like you're spending a lot more time than you are. And so I had... Um, Somebody high up in the organization come to me and say, hey, people are talking about this and it looks like you're not working anymore. And I was a, the, I was the marketing director and then the communications director. So people watching my example was something that I was worried about. Also, I just knew that like I don't want to leave someplace with a bad reputation. That can follow you around. And so I wanted to leave on the best terms that I could when it became clear about a year or so into this that this is something that I could probably monetize and, and start making a living off of. And so I did have a conversation with this person. I said, hey, um, help me understand this. He goes, well, I'm not saying anything, but other people are saying this. And I just want you to be aware of that. I said, well, here's the deal. And I had to have a few conversations with people about this because gossip happens and people sure. – like, it just looks like you're doing something. I said, look, this is my hobby. Uh, and for, first of all, I have cleared everything with my boss because – our company manual said all intellectual property created by employees belong to the company. And so I had to very clearly get in writing this book that I wrote, this blog that I have, these properties are exempt from that. And he was fine with it. He was very supportive. But it didn't that didn't stop people from saying things like, What are you doing? You know, kind of casting down on it. And it made me sometimes think about, should I quit? Like, is this stupid? And uh, really what it came down to is realizing, wait a second, every day I get up. At five o'clock in the morning, and I write for an hour, and then I publish it, and 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 this takes off, uh, and and then I go on on with the rest of my day, and then at night I kind of check in. Like this is my hobby, and, and a friend of mine who uh, was dealing with something similar told me a, a story where he had the same thing with his boss, and he just had to have a clear conversation. He goes, "Hey, um, I, I, I understand that you're worried about how much time I spend on Twitter, you know, talking about X, Y, or Z." Um, you coach your kids' volleyball team, right? Yeah, yeah, I love doing that. How much time do you do? How much time do you do that? Well, it's every every day for five days a week for about two hours. Wow, that's ten hours a week. What, what, what about games on the weekends? And you know, it came to the point it was like fifteen to twenty hours a week that this guy was spending on volleyball. He goes, you know, how much time I spend on Twitter every day? Thirty minutes. Uh, you know what the difference between your hobby and mine is? Mine's public. Everybody can see me tweeting or blogging or you know doing this thing on the side. And so it looks potentially bigger than it is. And so I had to have this conversation, you know, similar kind of conversation with, with you know somebody in my organization and, and basically say, thing one, I'm using everything that I'm learning to benefit our organization. I was. I was trying all this stuff with social media. And then I was going to the marketing team and saying, guys, we should do this and we should do this and we should do this. Um, I cannot help how people respond to what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm doing everything that I can to honor my current commitment. And I just, you know, like I was constantly clarifying with the people that I was working with, how I was spending my time and really trying to end that season honorably. And I think this is important um, mm -hmm. to not burn the bridges, uh, but at the same time to not stay stuck. And one of the things, one of the criticisms I heard was your personal brand is eclipsing the brand of the organization. And I said, okay, like, 
what do you want me to do about that? I'm not, it's not like, like I'm working eight times as hard. I spend an hour a day on this. I spend eight or nine or 10 hours a day on the organization. Like, what do you want me to do about that? I, I'm using everything that I can to help our organization. This is social media. So they respond better to people than they do to brands. And I think what I learned there was just because somebody has a perception of you and, and, and I, and I left that organization and there was like one or two people that were very, very critical about that. And, and that hurt, but I realized I'm not going to stay here to impress one or two naysayers when I have literally at this time, there were tens of thousands of people who were emailing me on a consistent basis. Every day there were people emailing me uh, saying, this is life changing. Thank you for this. And I, I had to have a conversation and I know you relate to this, Michael, uh, with a mentor of mine. Cause I was feeling tugged on these two different sides. It is, I was working for a ministry. Like I felt like maybe, maybe I was like turning my back on God going into business for myself and two conversations changed everything for me. One was a conversation with you where I shared those concerns and you said, Jeff, it's all ministry. You know, how you conduct yourself, uh, you can do, you can serve people through business or through nonprofit work or whatever. The second conversation was a friend of mine said this, he said, you need to consider the possibility because what's happened to you is so rare that this is your calling and not doing this would be an act of disobedience to God. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I have to do this. So that's my belief. I know that's not everybody's belief. And I'm not saying that has to be your belief, but I think you have to be pulled into this. This is not just some, you know, willy nilly idea. It's more than a passion. I talked to, I have to tell the story because it's so interesting. In the book, I talked to Alan Bean, the fourth man who walked on the moon. Guess what he does today? He is a full-time fine artist. He paints. What does he paint? Pictures of the moon. Because <laughs> he is the only <laughs> living artist who has ever walked the moon. And I said, I said to him, I made the mistake of saying, Alan, he's in his 80s now. He's, he lives in Houston, you know, thick Texan drawl coming through on the phone. And I said, I said, Alan, uh, you know, so you, you, you left NASA at 50 years old to go chase your creative passion. He goes, hang on a second, Jeff. Uh, you keep using this word passion. He goes, that's not why I did it. I didn't have some urge that I had to fulfill. He goes, I was a Navy man. Then I worked at NASA. The way I see it, I'm a man who has always done his duty. And when I, when I was standing around at NASA, seeing all these people who could do what I could do, anybody could do what I do. He's talking about flying the space shuttle, by the way. Anybody can do that. Nobody else can do this one thing that I'm not doing right now. He's, he was always painting on the side, but he realized he had an opportunity. And it was more than a whim. It was more than an urge. It was his duty. And when I left my job, it was, it was my duty. It was a calling. And I think that's the kind of thing that needs to pull you into this kind of work. All the other logistics, the money, the finances, the marketing, these are things you need to be aware of. But without that sense of calling of duty, um, it's not enough. Those are just details. Mm, so powerful. Okay, I want to get to a couple more questions because okay. we're running out of time. But I want to honor sure. the questions that we're getting uh, in the various social channels. So. Uh, Danya Dunlap on Facebook asks, what do you recommend to people who embrace their creativity but lack business sense or experience? Great question. It is a good question. My response to this, first of all, the opposite, the converse of being a, a starving artist is not rich artists, not wealthy artists. I understand that, that you know, personality types factor into this. Uh, the, the converse is just thriving artists. And I believe that every creative person has the ability to do their art and learn the basic set of competencies they need to thrive in their work. I was talking to somebody recently who said, man, I'm so – he's a writer and he's starting a blog and he's like, I'm so stressed about the business components of this. I was like, which part? He's like, well, bookkeeping. It's just it's, – it's overwhelming me. I said, dude, just sign up for Bench, bench.co. $150 a month and you get a full-time dedicated bookkeeper who's, you know, and, and it's not, I mean, if you have a big company, you want something more than that, but it's a great thing to, you know, start out with. And he goes, oh, wow, I had no idea that this existed. Um, I think it's like learning to balance your checkbook, right? So you wouldn't go to a Dave Ramsey seminar and go, yeah, but what if like you're just not good at personal finances? Dave would say, learn it. Like these are important enough skills. Nobody's asking you to become a master entrepreneur. I'm just saying that, uh, and we talk about these things in Real Artists Don't Serve because I realize these aren't obvious things for creative people necessarily. 
it, you can learn all these. These are acquisitive skills, meaning anybody can acquire them, not master them, but just learn them enough to do them and succeed with your art. Things like marketing, finance, and so on. So I, I think anybody can acquire these. Like, like I'm not good at balancing a checkbook, but guess what? I've had to learn how to do that. Otherwise, I can't pay my bills. Like this is about survival and then eventually thriving. Great, great answer. Okay, one more question. This one's from YouTube, and it's from uh, Style Life Photography, and they, he, she, not sure, asks, what if you've built momentum over 10 years only to have it slow to a crawl? How can someone rebuild the momentum while dealing with the uncertainty of needing to provide for a family? That's a tough question. Um, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like, you know, situationally. Uh, building momentum for 10 years is is a lot, right? Like that's a marathon. So I don't know if like you were building some towards something for 10 years or, or what that looks like. But in the course of 10 years, uh, Michael, you can relate to this too, especially online, everything's changing. The things that worked getting my business off the ground five, six years ago, those don't work the same way anymore. There are principles, there are fundamental strategies that continue to work. Uh, and, I, and that's what I share in the book are kind of these timeless strategies, not hacks or like you know, how to use YouTube or Twitter, but timeless things that always seem to work. Uh, so I think the, the answer to that question is first, go back to the things that have always seemed to work. So for example, with uh, creativity, one of the things that has always worked is this idea of practicing in public. So share it, putting your work in places where people can notice it, share it, and find out more about you. Um, that's always worked. I talked to an artist who's very successful today, Lisa Congdon, uh, and uh, she got started on Flickr right? Uh, sharing one piece of work every single day. And then eventually people started contacting her, offering to buy her work and commission her. Now today she's on Instagram. Flickr isn't the you know channel that it once was. So I would look at the stuff that's always worked. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but then consider maybe I need to be applying these strategies in new channels because channels change, but principles, timeless strategies, those things, many of those things remain constant and consistent. That's great. If I could just add to that piece of advice, this is one of the things yeah. that we've done periodically is just the whole process of pruning. You know, to look at sort of the, the range of activities or your portfolio of products or services and say, which are the ones that are really, you know, paying the bills? Which are the ones that are the most profitable, the ones that give me the most momentum and have the courage to cut off everything else, to trim it, you know, prune it back, and double down on the things that really work. I find that, that when I do that, that usually on the other side of a pruning comes a surge of growth. So for whatever that's worth. Jeff, as we wrap up here, um, any final thoughts to all the creatives that are watching this or will watch it in the replay? Okay, so um, I am really sort of... Uh, bullheaded about this, you know, like, I think this is really important. First, first of all, the only, the main takeaway I want to say is, is, um, the thing I said at the beginning of the book and I said at the beginning of this interview is being a starving artist today is a choice, not a necessary condition of doing creative work. I believe that I've seen that proven again and again. The book is not what has only worked for the past five years or stuff that only worked 50 years ago. It's timeless strategies of what it takes to creatively succeed for the past 500 years. Second, this is where I end the book, and I think it's important. Where you go from here is your choice. I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying you don't have to do work. I'm not saying there aren't challenges ahead of you. But where you go from here is your choice. And there is a story that I'll summarize very quickly. Uh, several years ago, uh, about in the 80s, so it's, you know, 30 years ago, several decades ago, um, there was a festival in this town called Livorno, Italy. And uh, basically what they were trying to do is they were trying to attract uh, a bunch of people to this festival. And one of their claims to fame was that this was the birthplace of an artist named Modigliani. And there was a story about Modigliani throwing uh, these statues into the channel or into the canal. And the story was they were so bad that people were like, oh, those are horrible. You should throw those in the canal. So he did. So here's what happens. They go, well, uh, we're not attracting a big tourist, uh, a bunch of tourists for this festival that we're throwing. So we'll... We'll drain the canal and see if Modigliani's statues are there. They drain the canal, and guess what's at the bottom of this canal? Three 
Modigliani statues. They bring in all these experts and they all go, that's a Modigliani, that's a Modigliani. And, and, the, and everyone goes crazy and it attracts this international sensation of all, this art community all coming to this small coastal town called Livorno. And everybody goes crazy until three college students step forward and say, those are fake. We made those. We threw them in the canal as a prank and we can't believe you guys think they're real. And here's the crazy thing, Michael. Nobody believes them. Like they go, no, no, they're real. <laughs> And all these, all these experts have staked their reputation on this. I mean, you've got the, you know, people from Rome coming in and they're going, hey, these are real. And, and, and they go, no, we'll show you. And they show people on national TV with a Black & Decker drill. They, they remake the bus and go, we did it again. See, it looks exactly like what you just pulled out. And people still don't believe them. <laughs> and then finally, after weeks and weeks of trying to prove that these are fake, Everybody wises up and goes, oh, I guess these are fake. And I think the story of the starving artist is like that. When you stake your reputation on it, when everybody's told you this, when it's a familiar story, sometimes it's easier to believe a familiar lie than it is to accept a difficult, albeit freeing and liberating truth. You don't have to starve. And if you are starving, uh, hopefully the book and other resources available to you are permission to thrive because I think the world needs your creative work and whether or not you get that out into the world and share it and thrive off it, that's not up to luck. It's not up to opportunity. It's up to you. Jeff, thank you. This has been so inspiring. Great interview. And guys, thank you for joining us. If you haven't done so already, please pick up a copy of Jeff's new book. You'll thank me later. Real Artists Don't Starve, Timeless Strategies for Thriving in the New Creative Age. And you can pre-order or order a copy at Amazon. It's available now. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Michael Hyatt Show. We're going to be taking next week off in honor of Independence Day here in the U.S. But I look forward to talking with you the following week. We're going to be at 4 o'clock Central Standard Time. But I'll be interviewing best-selling author John Gordon about why positive leaders achieve more, especially when they encounter adversity. Thanks for watching.